do this. Let's talk about Ben Cross. <laughs> Shakespeare class, we'll get to talk about it later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good afternoon, and join me in my journey in a world peopled by none other than William Shakespeare. A world of fools, beings, elves, fairies, and sprites, a monster, a king, and a plain dealing villain or two. Of course, we'll meet all kinds of fools, not just the wise fools dressed in motley, but those of tight fitting, hearty striped doublet and hose outfits with the conical cap and bells. <laughs> Lucky for you, I'm not in costume. <laughs> <laughs> In this garb, they were referred to as fools or jesters or clowns, what we might call today stand-up comics. <laughs> Although we still have our circus clown. No, not just the wise fools. We'll also meet the stupid fools. Drunkards, pedants, malcontents, and a fool that bore the name of Richard, a dangerous fool he, a king. He had a plethora of nicknames, a bunch-backed toad for one, the ultimate Machiavel among English kings. During his reign of terror, an unmitigated fiend, but in the end, alas, a self-confessed fool. But let us begin with our monster called Caliban from Shakespeare's final masterpiece, The Tempest. He lives on an island in the midst of the sea, offspring of a witch and of the devil himself, and slave to a banished duke. Be or fool. Our first brief meeting with him comes late in the play as he tries to reassure his newfound companions, two drunken and terrified survivors of a shipwreck, about his native island's innocent charm. Be not afeard, the eye is full of noises, sound and sweet airs that give delight to her not. Sometimes a thousand twangling instruments will come about my ears. Sometimes voices that if I then had waked after long sleep would make me sleep again. Then dreaming the clouds we thought would open and show riches ready to drop upon me. And when I waked, I cried to dream again. I cannot think of a better way to introduce the story of the Tempest and the various people that we meet there than to go straight to Tales from Shakespeare by Charles and Mary Lamb. The style of the Lambs, though indigenous to the 19th century, blends beautifully, I think, with the, the Tempest's fairy tale like quality. Indeed, you will find yourself later wondering where the Lambs left off and Shakespeare began. Here is a very brief excerpt. There was a certain island in the sea, the only inhabitants of which were an old man whose name was Prospero and his daughter Miranda, a very beautiful young lady. She came to this island so young that she had no memory of having seen any other face than her father's. They lived in a cave or cell made out of a rock. 
Being thrown by strange chance upon his island, which had been enchanted by a witch called Sycorax, who died there a short time before his arrival, Prospero, by virtue of his arts, released many good spirits that Sycorax had imprisoned in the bodies of large trees because they had refused to execute her wicked commands. These gentle spirits now were ever obedient to the will of Prospero. Of these, Ariel was the chief. The lively little sprite had nothing mischievous in his nature except that he took rather too much pleasure in tormenting an ugly monster called Caliban, for he owed him a grudge because, well, Caliban was the son of his old enemy, Sycorax. Caliban was lazy and neglected his work. Ariel, who was invisible to all eyes but Prospero's, would come slyly and pinch him, sometimes tumble him down in the mire, and then in the likeness of an ape would make mouths at him. With a variety of such like vexatious tricks, Ariel would often torment him. Having these powerful spirits obedient to his will, Prospero could by their means command the winds and the waves of the sea. By his orders, they raised a violent storm in the midst of which, and struggling with the wild sea waves that every moment threatened to swallow it up, he showed his daughter a fine large ship which he told her was full of living beings like themselves. Oh, my dear father, said she, if by your art you have raised this dreadful storm, have pity on their sad distress. See, see, the vessel will be dashed to pieces. Be not so amazed, daughter Miranda, there is no harm done. I have so ordered it that no person in the ship shall receive any hurt. What I have done has been in care of you, my dear child. Twelve years ago, I was Duke of Milan, and you were a princess and my only heir. I had a younger brother whose name was Antonio, to whom I trusted everything. And as I was fond of retirement and deep study, I commonly left the management of my state affairs to your uncle, my false brother, and so indeed he proved. The opportunity I gave him awakened in his bad nature a proud ambition to deprive me of my dukedom, and this he soon effected with the aid of Alonso, king of Naples, a powerful prince who also was mine enemy. Wherefore, said Miranda, did they not that hour destroy us? My child answered her father, they durst not, so dear was the love that my people bore me. My brother Antonio, however, carried us on board his ship, and when we were some leagues out at sea, he forced us into a small boat. There he left us as he thought to perish. But the kind lord of our court, one Gonzalo who loved me, privately placed in the boat, water, provisions, apparel, and some books which I prize above my duty. Know then, said her father, that by means of this storm, my enemies, the king of Naples, and my cruel brother Antonio are cast ashore upon this island. Having so said, Prospero gently touched his daughter with his magic wand, and she fell fast asleep. The spirit Ariel would soon present himself before his master to give an account of the tempest and how he had disposed of the ship's company. <laughs> of the ship's crew, Ariel tells Prospero, not one is missing, though each one thinks himself the only one saved. And the ship, though invisible to them, is safe in the harbor. Ariel, said Prospero, thy charge is faithfully performed, but there is more work yet. Go, make thyself like a nymph of the sea. Be subject to no sight but thine and mine, invisible to every eyeball else. Go, take this shape and hither come in. Go, hence, with diligence. Awake, dear heart, awake. Thou hast slept well, awake. The strangeness of your story put heaviness in me. Shake it off. 
Come on, we'll visit Caliban, my slave who never yields us kind answer. Tis a villain, sir, I do not love to look on. But as tis, we cannot miss him. He does make our fire, fetch in our wood, serves in offices that do profit us. But oh, slave Caliban, thou wilt thou speak? There's wood enough with it. <laughs> Come forth, I say, there's other business for thee. Come, thou Torcas, when? Ariel reappears like a water nymph. I, apparition, my quaint Ariel, hearken on you. Thou poisonous slave, got by the devil himself upon thy wicked dam, come forth! on thee, thou shalt be pitched as thick as honeycomb, and each pitch more stinging than bees that made them. I must eat my dinner. This island's mine by Sycorax, my mother, which thou takes from me. Thou camest first, thou strokest me and made much of me. Give me water with berries in it. Teach me how to name the bigger lights and how the less that burn by day and night. And then I love thee. Show thee all the qualities of the island. Springs, grind pits, barren place, and fertile. Curse be I that did so. All the charms of Sycorax, toes, beetles, bats, lie on you, for I am all the subjects that you have, which first was mine own king. And here you sky me in this hard rock whilst you do keep from me the rest of the island. Oh, most lying slave, whose stripes may move not kindness. I have used thee, built as thou art, with humane care, and lodged thee in mine own cell, till thou didst seek to violate the honor of my child. <laughs> what has been done? Thou didst prevent me. I had peopled out this isle with Caliban's. Horrid slave, which any prince of goodness would not take, being capable of all ill, I pitied thee, took pains to make thee speak, taught thee each hour. You taught me language, and my prophet on is I know how to curse. The red plague rich you for learning me your language. Fetch us in a few, and be quick. Thou art best to answer other business. Shrugs thou malice? Thou neglect or dost unwillingly what I command, I'll wrap thee with old cramps. Fill all thy bones with aches, make thee roar that beasts shall tremble at thy din. No oh, praise. I must obey. His art is of such power, 
It would control my dance card set of us and make a vassal of him. So, slave, hence! The raging storm continues unabating as it hounds the survivors of the shipwreck onto the shore. Meanwhile, Caliban goes off to gather in wood. We find him later in a clearing. Thunder is heard. Oh, the infections that the sun sucks up from bogs, fens, flats, on prosper fall and make him by his feel a disease. Hear me, and yet I needs must curse. The Eldor pinch, fright me with urchin shows, lead me like a firebrand in the dark, out of my way, unless he bid them. But for every trifle are they set upon me. Sometimes like apes that mow and chatter at me and after bite me. Then like hedgehogs which lie tumbling in my barefoot way and mount their pricks at my footfall. Sometimes am I all wound with adders who with cloven tongues do hiss me into madness. Truculo. A member and provider of entertainment for the shipwrecked company and dressed as a jester appears close by. He is wandering aimlessly on the island seeking cover from the storm. Caliban sees him. <laughs> Here comes a spirit of his and to torment me for bringing wood slowly. Flat. Chance he will not mind me. There is neither shrub nor bush to bear off any weather at all, and another storm brewing. I hear it sing in the wind. Yon huge black cloud looks like a foul bombard that would shed his liquor. If it's a thunder as it did before, I do not wear it to hide my head. Yon same cloud cannot choose but fall by pale from. What have we here? A man or a fish? Dead or alive? <laughs> a fish! <laughs> smells like a fish. A very ancient and fish like smell. <laughs> Strange fish. Were I in England now, as once I was, and had but this fish painted, not a holiday fool there but would give a piece of silver. There would this monster make a man's fortune. Any strange beast there makes a man. When they will not give a doit to a leave a lame beggar, they'll lay out ten to see a dead Indian. <laughs> Legged like a man. Fins like a Warm of my talk. I do now let loose my opinion. Hold it no longer. This is no fish, but an islander that hath lately suffered from a thunderbolt. Noise of thunder. Old oh, storms come again. My best way is to creep under his gabardine. There is no other shelter hereabout. Oh, misery acquaints a man with strange bedfellows. <laughs> <laughs> Here, hiding me under this, with the earthen dregs of the storm. Stefano, a shipmate of Trinculo's and butler cook to the crew, appears a bottle in his hand. I shall no more to see, to see. Here shall I die ashore. 
this is a very scurvy tune to sing at a man's funeral. But here's my comfort. The master, the sailor, the boatswain, and I, the gunner, and his mate. Love more, Megan, Mary, and Marjorie. None of us cared for Kate. <laughs> she had a tongue with a tang, would cry to a sailor, go away. We loved not to save her a tar nor a pitch. Yet a tailor could scratch her where her shit had itch. <laughs> and the sea boys have let her go away. Well, this is a very scurvy tune, too. Here's <laughs> my comfort. Oh, do not permit me, girl! What's the matter? The devil's here. You put tricks upon us with savages and men of India. I have not escaped drowning to be appeared now of your four legs. For it has been said, as proper a man as ever went up four legs cannot make him new ground. And it shall be said so again, while Stefano breathes at nostrils. Oh, do not torment me, oh! This is some monster of the isle with four legs who have got that taken an ague. Where the devil should he learn our language? I will give him some relief of me, but for that, if I can recover him and keep him tame and get to Naples with him, he's a present for any emperor that ever trod on Neek's leather. Oh, do not torment me, Billy. I'll, I'll bring my wood home faster. He says, fit now and does not talk after the wisest. He shall taste of my bottle. If he have never drank wine afore, this will go near to remove his fit. If I can recover him and keep him tame, I will not take too much for him. He shall pay for him that hath him and that soundly. How oh, does he get the glimmer hurt? Oh, will for no man, I know it by that trembling. Now prosper works upon me. Come on thy ways, open your mouth. Here's that which will give language to your cat. Open your mouth. This will shake your shaking, I can tell you, and then soundly. You cannot tell who's your friend. I should know that voice. It should be... But he's drowned. And these are devils. Oh, defend me. Four legs and two voices. <laughs> A most delicate monster. His forward voices. To speak well of his friend, his backward voice is to utter foul speeches and to detract. All the wine of my bottle will recover him. I will help his ache you. Come. Oh, Amen. I'll pour some in my other mouth. <laughs> Still! Not my other mouth, call me. Yes, yes. This is a devil and no monster. I shall leave you. Stefano! If thou be Stefano, touch me, speak to me, for I am Triculo. Be not afraid by thy good friend Triculo. If thou be Triculo, come forth. I'll pull thee by the lesser legs. <laughs> Many be Triculo's legs, and these be there. Wow. Very Triculo indeed. How came thou to be the siege of this moon cap? He bent Triculos. Oh, I took him to be killed with a thunderstroke. But I've not drowned, Stefano. I hope now thou art not drowned. Is the storm overblown? I hid me under the dead moon cap's cavity for fear of the storm. But art thou living, Stefano? Oh, Stephano, two Neapolitan skates! Oh, not 
turn me about. My stomach is not constant. <laughs> Please be kind things and they be not sprites. That's a brave god. Bear celestial liquor. I will kneel to him. How didst thou skip? How camest thou hither? Swear upon this bottle. How about the hither? I escaped on a butt of sack which the sailors heaved overboard. By this bottle, which I made from the bark of a tree with my own hand since I was cast ashore. Well, swear upon that bottle to be thy true subject, for thy liquor is not earthly. Here, swear then thou how escapest. Swum like a swum like a duck, man. I can swim like a duck, I'll be sworn. Here, kiss the book. Oh, I can swim like a duck, thou art made like a goose. Oh, Stefano, has any more of this? The whole back, man, my cellar is on a rock by the seaside where my wine is hid. Ah, now, Mooncalf, how dost thy debut? Hast thou not dropped from heaven? Out of the moon, I do assure thee. I was the man in the moon when time was. Uh, I have seen thee in her, and I do adore thee. My mistress showed me thee, and thy dog, and thy bush. Come, swear to that. Kiss the book. I will finish it with new contents later. Swear! This good like this is a very shallow monster. I appear to him, the man of the moon, the most poor, credulous monster. I'll show thee a big fertile inch of the island. I will kiss thy foot. I prithee be my god. Come on then, down and swear. I shall laugh myself to death at this puppy headed monster. Come, kiss. I'll show thee the best springs. I'll pluck thee berries. I'll fist for thee and get thee wood enough. The plague upon the tyrant that I serve. I'll bear him no more sticks, but follow thee, thou wondrous man. A most ridiculous monster to make a wonder out of a poor drunkard. <laughs> Will you let me bring thee with Crabs grow, and I with my long nails will dig thee pig nuts, throw thee a jerry's nest, and instruct thee how to snare the in Mumarasset. I'll bring thee to clustery filberts. Sometimes I'll get thee young scannels from the rock. Wilt thou go with me? I prithee now, lead the way without any more talking. Trinculo, the king, and all our company else being drowned, we will inherit here. Here, bear my bottle, fellow Trinculo. We'll fill them by and by again. Farewell, master. Farewell, farewell. A towering monster, a drunken monster. No more dams I'll make for this, nor fetch in firing at requiring, nor scrape trenchering or wash this. Bang! Bang! Ta Charlie Bang! As a new master, get a new man! Freedom! Heide! Heide! Freedom! Freedom! Heide! Freedom! Oh, master, monster, leave!
Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I've got another half hour yet. <laughs> Much Ado About Nothing, a sparkling romantic comedy of matches, mismatches, near mismatches, matchings up again. And of course, a right proper villain to stir up some mischief. A brief villain in the person of Don John, bastard brother to Don Pedro. He's always a bastard, of course. <laughs> Don John is another one of those dour and melancholy fellows, frustrated yet effective enough to wreak havoc for a while among the revelers. But foiled in the nick of time, trapped the lass at a comedy. He's a Jake when he's on his way to becoming uh, Richard III. Oh, how he might have envied the great Prince of Darkness. Well, let's listen in on Don John and his cohorts, Conrad of Boraccio, at the outset as they rally for trouble. What the good year, my lord? Why are you thus out of measure, sir? There is no measure in the occasion that breeds, therefore my sadness is without limit. Oh, you should hear reason! And when I've heard it, what blessing brings it? Well, if not a present remedy, at least a patient sufferance. I wonder that thou, being as thou sayest thou art born under Saturn, goest about to apply a moral medicine to a mortifying mischief. I cannot hide what I am. I must be sad when I have uh, cause and smile at no man's jest. Eat when I have stomach and wait for no man's leisure. Sleep when I am drowsy and tend on no man's business. Laugh when I am merry and claw no man in his humor. Hey, but you must not make the full show of this till you may do it without controlment. You have of late stood out against your brother, and he have newly taken you into his grace. Where well, it is impossible you should take true root but by the fair weather that you make yourself. It is needful that you frame the season for your own harvest. I'd rather be a canker in a hedge than a rose in his grace. And it better fits my blood to be disdained of all than to fashion a carriage to rob love from any. In this, though I cannot be said to be a flattering, honest man, it must not be denied, but I am a plain, dealing villain. I am trusted with a muzzle and enfranchised with a clog. Therefore I have decreed not to sing in my cage. If I had my mouth, I would bite. If I had my liberty, I would do my liking. In the meantime, let me be that I am, and seek not to alter me. Can you make no use of your discontent? I make all use of it, for I use it only. I'll say, listen to this. <laughs> what? Claudio loves Hero, cousin of Beatrice. Don Pedro, brother of Don John, wants Beatrice and Benedict to fall in love at the same time offers to help Claudio to woo Hero by pretending to be Claudio. A servant overhears and tells Hero's uncle, Antonio, who tells Leonardo that Don Pedro loves Hero, while another servant tells Don John that Claudio is about to wed Hero. Don John has Baraccio, a maidservant, poses Hero and a lover for Don Pedro to see. Don Pedro then tells Claudio that Hero is unfaithful. Baraccio tells Conrad of Don John's plot. Night watchman overhears and takes Baraccio and Conrad to the governor to tell him the truth. Meanwhile, Don Pedro and Claudio tell church congregation of Hero's deceit, and she collapses and plays dead. Beatrice <laughs> believes Hero, Benedict believes Beatrice. Beatrice tells Benedict to kill Claudio, who is told by a constable what Baraccio and Conrad have told him. Claudio feels guilty because he doubted his beloved Hero. Leonardo tells Claudio to marry his niece, who resembles the dead Hero, but is the live Hero. <laughs> Don John is taken away, thank God. Claudio and Hero relax, we fall in love and vow never again, etc., etc. Curtain!
discontent. I make all use of it, but I use it only. <laughs> <laughs> Spider, the ultimate Machiavelli, Richard Crookback, Duke of Gloucester, later the dead King Richard III. His defeat and death at Bosworth Field in 1485 marks the conclusion of almost a century of England's bloodiest civil wars, later dubbed by history as the Wars of the Roses. It was a watershed in history, where it marks, as well as any single event, the end of the Middle Ages and of what had remained of the Age of Chivalry. 1485, seven short years before Columbus first sets foot in the New World. During a greater part of the century leading up to Richard's reign, Henry Bolingbroke, ultimately King Henry IV, and his heirs under the banner of the Red Rose of the House of Lancaster ruled England through the many wars that Richard II had so long ago ominously prophesied until Bolingbroke's grandson, Henry VI, is finally defeated by the legions of the Royal Duke of York, leader of the White Rose faction. The Duke, who everyone assumed would become king with the victory on his side, was killed near the end of the fighting, and power instead fell to the Duke's eldest son, Edward, who became King Edward IV. Richard of Gloucester, third son of the victorious Duke, is about to take center stage. Witness now, then, some crucial episodes in this drama of Richard's tenuous seizure of the crown through murder and coercion and of his ultimate downfall and death on the battlefield by the sword of Henry Tudor, as Richard, alas, cries out in abject despair, A horse, a horse, my kingdom for a horse. At the beginning of the play, then, Richard's eldest brother reigns as Edward IV. Thus standing directly in the way of Richard's path to the throne, uh, the king himself, along with his two sons, the two boy princes about whose imprisonment in the Tower of London legends abound, and one of whom reigns for a matter of weeks as Edward V, by the grace of God and his uncle Richard, until, but more of that later. And finally, there is George, Duke of Clarence, the second of Richard's two older brothers, all of these persons stand in his way. In the opening soliloquy, the York family, Richard is telling us, is enjoying the fruits of its great victory and hailing their new king's accession with many festive celebrations. But this is not all of what Richard is telling us. Listen. Now is the winter of our discontent made glorious summer by this sun of York. And all the clouds that lowered upon our house and the deep bosom of the ocean buried. Now are our brows bound with victorious weeds, our bruised arms hung up for monuments, our stern alarms to merry meetings, our dreadful marches to delightful measures. Grim visage war had smoothed his wrinkled front. Now, instead of mounting barbed steeds to fight the souls of fearful adversaries, he capers nimbly in a lady's chamber to the lascivious pleasing of a lute. But I that am not shaped for sportive tricks, nor made to court an amorous looking glass. I am rudely stamped and want love's majesty to strut before a wanton ambling nymph. I am curtailed of this fair proportion, cheated of feature by dissembling nature, deformed, unfinished, sent before my time into this breathing world scarce half made up. 
that's so lamely and unfashionable that dogs bark at me as I walk by them. Why, I, in this weak, piping time of peace, have no delight to pass away the time, unless to see my shadow in the sun and descant on my own deformity. And therefore, since I cannot prove a lover to entertain these fair, well-spoken days, I am determined to prove a villain and hate the idle pleasures of these days. Plots have I laid, inductions dangerous, and by drunken prophecies, libels and greed, to set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate, the one against the other. And if King Edward be as true and just as I am, subtle, false, and treacherous, this day should Clarence closely be mewed up about a prophecy which says that G of Edward's heirs, the murderer, shall be. Die, thoughts down to my soul, here Clarence come. George, Duke of Clarence, under guard, approaches. Uh, Brackenbury is lieutenant in charge. Brother, good day. What means this armored guard that waits upon your grace? His Majesty, tendering my person's safety, hath appointed this conduct to convey me to the tower. Upon what cause? Because my name is George. Alack, my lord, that fault is none of yours. He you should for that commit your godfathers. Oh, be like his majesty has some intent that you should be new christened in the tower. But what's the matter, Clarence, may I know? Yea, Richard, when I know, for I protest as yet I do not, but as I can learn, he hearkens after prophecies and dreams and from the cross row plucks the letter G and says a wizard told him that by G his issue disinherited should be. And for my name of George begins with G, it follows in his thought that I am he. These as I learn and such like toys as these have moved his highness to commit me now. Why, this it is when men are ruled by women. It's not the king that sends you to the tower. My lady Grey, his wife Clarence, tis she that tempers him to this extremity. Was it not she and that good man of worship, Anthony Woodville, her brother there, that made him send Lord Hastings to the tower, from which this present day he is delivered? We are not safe, Clarence, we are not safe. Brackenbury, I beseech your graces both to pardon me. His majesty hath straightly given in charge that no man shall have private conference of what degree soever with your brother. Even so, and please your worship, Brackenbury, you may partake of anything we say. Brother, farewell. I will unto the king, and whatsoever you will employ me in, for to call King Edward's widow sister, I will perform it to enfranchise you. In the meantime, this deep disgrace in brotherhood touches me deeper than you can imagine. I know it pleases neither of us well. Well, your imprisonment shall not be long. I will deliver you or else lie for you. Meantime, have patience. I must perforce farewell. Clarence, Brackenbury, and Guard, leave. Go tread the path that thou shalt ne'er return, simple, plain Clarence. I do love thee so that I shall shortly send thy soul to heaven. <laughs> <laughs> if heaven will take the present at our hands. <laughs> but who comes here? You delivered Hastings. Enter Hastings. Good time of day unto my gracious Lord. As much unto my good Lord Chamberlain. Well, are you welcome to the open air? How hath your lordship brooked imprisonment? With patience, noble lord, as prisoners must. But I shall live, my lord, to give them thanks that were the cause of my imprisonment. No doubt, no doubt, and so shall Clarence too. 
for they that were your enemies are his, uh, and have prevailed as much on him as you. But news abroad, no news so bad abroad as this at home. The king is sickly, weak, and melancholy, and his physicians fear him mightily. Now, by St. Paul, that news is bad indeed. Oh, he hath kept an evil diet long, and over much consumed his royal uh, person. It is very grievous to be thought upon. Where is he in his bed? He is. Uh, go you before, and I will follow you. Exit Hastings. He cannot live, I hope. But must not die. Oh, George, be packed with him. Post horse up to heaven. I'll in to urge his hatred more to Clarence, who lies well steeled with weighty arguments. And if I fail not in my deep intent, Clarence hath not another day to live. Which done, God take King Henry to his mercy and leave the world for me to bustle in. For then I'll marry Warwick's youngest daughter. What though I killed her husband and her father? The readiest way to make the wench amends is to become her husband and her father. <laughs> which will I not all so much for love as for another secret close intent by marrying her, which I must reach unto. But yet I run before my horse to market. Clarence still breathes. Edward still lives and reigns. When they are gone, then must I count my gain. Before Richard's own demise at the end of the play, he will have eliminated eleven kinsmen and his like uh, who had stood in his way to the crown. In this scene, Richard confronts Warwick's youngest daughter, Anne. She is such a troubling adversary with her lamentations and curses. She accompanies the cortege of her father-in-law, King Henry VI, Richard's latest victim. Still, Anne is best kept alive momentarily, simply because, well, if he can get her without too much coercion, she might just make a suitable wife and future mother to his heirs. The whole scene, a large part of it I will slide over, is a remarkable encounter made plausible by Richard's extraordinary assembly. At first, and tries to rid herself of Richard with, Avant thou dreadful minister of hell! By the end of the scene, Richard has virtually won her, with having placed a ring on her finger, no less, saying, Look how my ring encompasses thy finger. Even so, thy breast encloses my poor heart. Where both of them, both of them are thine. And if thy poor devoted servant may but beg one favor at thy gracious hand, thou dost confirm his happiness forever. What is it? That it may please you leave these sad designs to him that hath most cause to be a mourner, and presently repair to Crosby House, where after I have solemnly interred at Chertsey Monastery this noble king, and wet his grave with my repentant tears, I will with all expedient duty seek you. For divers unknown reasons, I beseech you grant me this boon. With all my heart, and much it joys me too to see you are become so penitent. take up the cross. <laughs> Towards Chertsey, noble lord, no white fires there to my coming. Was ever a woman in this humor wound? Was ever a woman in this humor wound? I'll have her, but I will not keep her long. <laughs> what, I that killed her husband and her father, to take her in her heart's extremest hate, 
curses in her mouth, tears in her eyes, the bleeding witness of her, I hate to advise, having God, her conscience, and these bars against me, and I no friends to back my suit with all but the plain devil and the separate wounds. And yet to win her, all the world to nothing. Ha! Has she forgot already that brave Prince Edward, her lord, whom I some three months since stabbed in my angry mood at Dewsbury? And will she ever base her eyes on me that cropped the golden prime of this sweet prince and made her widow to a woeful bed? On me that halts and am misshapen thus? I do to a beggarly then, yet I do mistake my person all this while. Upon my life she finds, although I cannot, myself to be a marvelous proper man. I will be at charges for a looking glass and entertain a score or two of tailors to uh, study fashions to adorn my body. Since I am crept in favor with myself, I will maintain it with some little cost. But first I'll turn yon fellow in his grave and then return lamenting to my love. <coughs> Shine out there, son, till I have bought a glass that I may see my shadow as I pass. As we watch Richard's royal progress, as it were, to the throne, I am reminded of a definition of conscience by a writer of our own era, H.L. Mencken. It fits Richard rather well, I think. Conscience, the inner voice that warns us that someone may be looking. <laughs> We now lead well forward into the action. Richard's two brothers are dead, King Edward of natural causes and poor George murdered, alas, drowned in a butt of Malmsey wine. <laughs> it is Richard's coronation, and indeed many in the court and elsewhere are looking on aghast, fearing for their lives. Among them his first lieutenant, the Duke of Buckingham, the kingmaker himself, who till now has conspired to put Richard on the throne. In the beginning, it was all smooth as silk for Richard, but the gathering storm begins to make itself felt. Henry Tudor, the Earl of Richmond, the last claimant of the old House of Lancaster, has raised an army against him, and one by one, Richard's followers go over to the other side. Yet, throughout all this, Richard is still obsessed with the one gnawing obstacle still remaining before his claim to the throne is absolutely secured. His nephews, the two boy princes, still alive, under guard in the tower. Listen to Richard at the culmination of the formal proceedings of his coronation ceremony as he summons Buckingham to his side. Stand all apart, cousin of Buckingham, my gracious sovereign. Give me thy hand. Thus high by thy advice and thy assistance is King Richard seated. But shall we wear these glories for a day, or shall they last and we rejoice in them? Still, hey, forever let them last. Ah, oh, Buckingham, now do I play the touch to try if thou be current gold indeed. Young Edward lives. Think now that I will speak. Say on, my loving lord. Why, Buckingham, I say I would be king. Why, so you are my thrice renowned lord. Huh. Am I king? Tis so, but Edward lives. True, noble prince. Oh, bitter consequence that Edward still should live, true, noble prince. Cousin, I was not want to be so dull, shall I be plain? I wish the bastard's dead, and I would have it something wrong. <laughs> but sayest thou now, speak suddenly, be brief. Your grace may do your pleasure. Tut, tut, thou art all ice, thy kindness freezes. Say, have I thy consent that they shall die? Give me some little 
breath, some pause, dear Lord, before I positively speak of this, I will resolve you herein presently. And Buckingham retires. I will converse with iron-witted fools and unrespective boys. None are for me that look into me with considerate eyes. I, reaching Buckingham, grow circumspect. Boy, my lord, knowst thou not any whom corrupting gold will tempt unto a close exploit of death? I know a discontented gentleman whose humble means match not his haughty spirit. Gold were as good as twenty orators, and will no doubt tempt him to anything. What is his name? His name, my lord, is Tyrrell. I partly know the man. Go call him hither, boy. The deep revolving witty Buckingham no more shall be the neighbor to my counsels. Hath he so long held up with the untired? Stops he now for breath. Well, be it so. Enter Stanley. How now, Lord Stanley? What's the news? No, my loving lord, the Marquis Dorset, as I hear, is fled to Richmond in the parts where he abides. Enter a page with Tyrrell. Thy name, Tyrrell? James Tyrrell, and your most obedient subject, art thou indeed? Prove me, my gracious lord. There's thou resolve to kill a friend of mine. <laughs> Please you, but I'd rather kill two enemies. I then thou hast. Two deep enemies are they that I would have thee deal upon. Tyrrell, I mean those bastards in the tower. <laughs> Let me have open means to come to them, and soon I'll rid you from the fear of them. Thou sing sweet music. Hark, come hither, Tiru. Go by this token. Rise and bend the ear. There's no more but so. Say it is done, and I shall love thee and prefer thee for it. I will dispatch it straight. Exit to re enter Buckingham. Uh, my lord, I have considered in my mind the late the man that you did sound me in. Well, at that rest, Dorset is fled to Richmond. I hear the news, my lord. Stanley, he is your wife's son. Well, look at me. Uh, my lord, I claim the gift, my due by promise, for which your honor and your faith is pawned. The earl, earldom of Hereford and the movables, which you have promised, I shall possess. Stanley, look to your wife. If she convey letters to Richmond, you shall answer it. What says your highness to my just request? I do remember me. Henry VI did prophesy that Richmond should be king. Richmond was a little peevish boy. King, perhaps. And my lord, what a chance the prophet could not at that time have told me, I being there, that I should have killed him. My lord, your promise for the Earl of Richmond. When last I was at Exeter, the mayor in courtesy showed me the castle and called it Rochmont, at which name I started because a bard of Ireland once told me that I should not live long after I saw Rich mind. My lord, I watch a clock. Well, I have thus both put your grace in mind of what you promised me. Well, but what's a clock? Upon the stroke of ten. Well, then it strike. Why then it strike? Because that like a jack thou keeps the stroke betwixt thy begging and my meditation. I am not on the giving vein today. Why then resolve me whether you will or no. Thou troublest me! I am not on the vein! King exits and leaving Buckingham alone on the dais. Is it thus? 
pays he my deep service with such contempt? Made I him king for this? Oh, let me think on Hastings that be gone to Brecknock while my fearful head is on. We bring Richard's story to a close on the eve of his last and fatal battle at Bosworth Field. The victory of Richmond will establish the new Tudor age, later to be made illustrious, if not pure, by Richmond's son, Henry VIII, and, uh, well, somewhat purified again, so to speak, by his granddaughter, Elizabeth I, partly attested to at least by her being dubbed the Virgin Queen. Here now, then, the death throes of an exhausted Plantagenet England crystallized in one night of horror the bunch of back toe never quite made it. Richard is awakening from a dreadful nightmare which has produced awful visitations from each one of his several tragic victims. Give me. Give me another horse! Bind up my wounds! Have mercy, Jesus! me for a villain. Perjury, perjury in the highest degree. Murder, stern murder in the direst degree. All several sins, all used in each degree. Wrong to the bar, crying all guilty, guilty. I shall despair. There's no creature loves me. And if I die, no soul shall pity me. Say, wherefore should they? Since that I myself find in myself no pity to myself. Methought the souls of all that I had murdered came to my tent and every one did threat tomorrow's vengeance on the head of Rich. I leave you now in the company of Puck in the warm afterglow of an evening's entertainment in the palace of Theseus. Summer night's dream. How oh, the hungry lion roars and the wolf the howls and hoot. Whilst the heavy plowman snores, all the weary tasks were done. Now oh, the wasted brands do glow, whilst the screech owl screeching loud puts the wretch that lies in woe in remembrance of a shroud. 
Now it is the time of night, the big graves all gaping wide. Everyone lets forth his sprite in the churchway paths to drive. And we fairies that do run by the triple Hecate's team from the presence of the sun following darkness like a dream. Now we frolic. Not a mouse shall disturb this hallowed house. I am sent with broom before to sweep the dust behind the door.